On this edition of Yukon Today, a full show documentary look at Cassiar, British Columbia. The northern asbestos mining town closed down for the final time on Halloween. More than a mine has closed, a whole community has disappeared. Tonight, a requiem for Cassiar. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Yukon Today. I'm Gordon Lovren. In 1954, men and equipment came to this valley and began chipping away at a mountainous task. Up there was a treasure that the whole world wanted. Asbestos, a magical mineral with magical properties. In its heyday, Cassiar boasted a population of 2,000 people. Children were born and raised here. They got married and had children of their own. Life was pretty good because just about everyone who lived here worked for the company that owned the town and the mine. We've come here to tell you a story about the people who made this place special. People who are trying to cope and finding it hard because now it's gone. Follow the sun till it goes down Night lights turn on the dancing ground Whisper of the reasons why things change today How many years of prosperity just fades away When this mine was operating, it was producing 110,000 tons of asbestos a year. The value of the product fluctuated between $400 and $2,000 a ton. Cassiar's product went to markets in Asia, the Pacific Rim, and Europe. Asbestos also sold in the United States until that country banned it in 1982 for environmental and health reasons. Princeton Mines bought Cassiar from its previous owners in the late 1980s. Former employees allege the company mismanaged this property, but they also say the union didn't help matters either. Cassiar was bankrupt and the company said shut her down. People were ready to accept the fact that they were out of work, but they wanted the community to be turned over to the B.C. government. This would mean at the very least the town would carry on. Mike Harcourt's NDP government assured residents they would take care of things. They told families there would be a soft closure, meaning a gradual shutdown over a period of six months. But on February 4th of this year, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Workers were stunned when the provincial government changed its mind and said Cassiar would be closing as soon as possible. At the 30, at 25, at 25, at 27, 5 then, at 27, 5. Where are you? It's September 15th and more than 600 people from all over North America have come to Cassiar to pick the spoils of a town gone broke. Everything is for sale from mining equipment worth millions to homes, even down to signposts marking the streets in Cassiar. Almost 40 years of activity will soon be sold off at dirt cheap prices. One home sold for $300. For many residents of Cassiar, it's a bitter pill for them to swallow, seeing others buying up their memories and trucking them away. For somebody who remembers the place the way it was, to come back into here, it's just, it just devastates. People have come in and they just cry, you know, they just cry, it's, it's, it's amazing. And people up here for the auction say, you know, you have a real town here, You're like, you had a church, you had schools, you had a curling rink, you had a swimming pool. I don't know how many people said that to me at the auction, I said, what did you think we were? You know, a little, a couple of trailers or what? Well, yeah, you know, and, and it was, that's not what it was. It was a real town, a real community, and they were just couldn't believe it. Just after the announcement by the BC government to dismantle the town, residents produced a t-shirt that says, Vote NDP. Cassiar did. Many of the people here feel betrayed by the provincial government. The New Democratic Party is supposed to be a political organization that protects and looks out for the best interests of the working person. John Slana, who first came to Cassiar when he was 18 years old, spent 25 years working here. He blames politicians for Cassiar's demise. I flee Yugoslavia, what used to be Yugoslavia. I flee for the same reason they're fighting now 25 years later. And I see in Canada it's getting the same stupid thing. 
because just a politician. They cannot bring people together. They have to divide it. They they, they have to. They got their, their their imagination where got elected. I got the power, and now we'll do it. Uh, they do it backwards. Everything. Look at Maroney not, uh, in early days. He shut Sheffer Shefferville down in Quebec. Now it's Cassier. What's going to next be Canada? That's my country. I come here to pledge to be a Canadian. To be proud to be Canadian. I can be. How can I be? Yeah, Canadian on the street. We were beating Fair Fairbanks, Alaska. Lee Corn moved to Cassiar in 1966. She worked for the Cassiar Courier, a community newspaper. She says residents need to know the real reason for the shutdown of the town. Only then, she says, may they be able to cope with their loss. I have tried to figure out for the last six months why it is happening because there's no reason, there's enough ore in the mine. There was a town here that was uh, well established and it just doesn't make any reason and I think that's why it's so difficult for us to to understand what is happening because nobody has ever really come to us and said why the government is doing that. I mean it just doesn't make sense. You know, can you find any reason why a government would come in and shut down, destroy a, a well-established town that has been here for 35 years? It, it just doesn't make sense, you know? And, and it's, it's really upsetting. I think if we knew the reason why, it might be a little easier to take. About 600 jobs were lost when Cassier closed down. Around 350 came from the mine and the plant site and the various other departments run by Princeton Mining. The rest came from those truck drivers who worked for Aero Transportation, the company that hauled the asbestos fiber to a deep seaport in Stewart, BC. The Royal Bank had at least 15 people who made Cassier their home, plus BC government workers. So the impact of Cassier's closure is like that of a pebble hitting a pond. The waves just keep spreading. It's 1 o'clock on October 31st. Today is Halloween, but no one in Cassiar is trick-or-treating. Tony Korn is one of only a handful of employees still left in Cassiar. He was left on the payroll to help out during the final shutdown of the town. He came to work for Cassiar in July of 1964. In 1971, he married Lee. You remember her, she was the one who worked for the town's newspaper. They had two daughters, Joanne and Janice. Tony says he'd like people to know Cassier helped others in the province of BC through the taxes it put into the economy. They don't realize actually that this place in here has been running for over 40 years, which uh, we generate a lot of taxes and everything for other people, which the citizens of BC and probably all through the Canada. And uh, now we really like uh, the wife said that um, Lee says that doesn't make any sense to spend more money from the taxpayer just to avoid it, the loan of $13 million to get back on our feet. Uh, there was no any try 
from anyone, the government, not, no, nor a, a way to, to, to try to prove themselves, to say, okay, let's give them a chance. It was a complete no, and that's it. But uh, if you start to do all over the province, the same that we got through Casiar, we will be all going to employment insurance, to welfare, really, because what they have to try in India is to generate work, make money, so we can all survive, but with tax and so on. But if you start to cut it down all over the place, well, then what are we going to come to it? And here was the example in here. We have the quality of the fiber. We have the sale. Okay, if the management is not there to prove they can do a proper job, bring it in some of the government people, which they could supervise that, and make sure that the, the funding was put it in proper in the proper place. Tony says the hardest hit by the closure are the children who were born in Cassiar. He says with the town wiped off the map, they have no roots to call home. Where were you born? In Cassiar. Where is Cassiar? It's not there anymore. Which people don't realize how the kids can take it today, you know. At least if you move it from one place to another, you still have a place to go back and see it. Right now here, and next year by June, will be all grass and grain and trees and plant reclamation, whatever it is to it. And it will be another piece of land with forestry. That's all it is, just memory. And it could be survived for a few more years if the government was inclined to put some effort in there to keep it going. Yeah. Well, our kids were both born here. <laughs> I'm sure you share the same feeling because you were, grew up here too, and uh, they're finding it extremely difficult to to um, accept the fact that it's not going to be here anymore. The new store extension, God, yeah. we used to get excited over things yeah. like that. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. That was sort of the biggest thing that we was, ever yeah. covered, actually, in the newspaper as far for us, you know. Look at this, Manly and oh, yeah. Paul Garducci. Isn't that yeah. so <laughs> Oh, the store expansion. Yeah. Finning open. I remember when they the did that. Yeah. Right. yeah. CCC elections. Yeah. Who was leaving? Um, I can't remember who left there. <laughs> we had so many of them. Yeah. And they always came back. Oh, I too. know. So many people came back. Yeah. They were number one again. Well, this is my home there. I got $14,000. Now go, where can I buy a home for $14,000? I spent 24 years paying for this thing. Now I'm on the street. I got no job. Who's going to give me mortgage? I don't even have enough money for down payment. <laughs> the bank that I, I deal with for all these years is not going to tell me, get lost. We don't know you anymore. That's what's going to happen. I'll give you an example. You buy a house in Whitehurst 20, 20 years ago, you pay, let's say, uh, $15,000 for it. How much your house would be worth today? That's what I'm losing. The 24 years I was paying into this house, and now I got nothing. $14,000, I go on the street, go down to Vancouver or Edmonton or Prince George or wherever I'm going to go. I said, I want to buy a house, I got $14,000. The guy's gonna laugh straight in my face. So where do you come from? I say Cassiar. Yeah. You know, it hurts most go to see you come back to Cassiar. I remember you growing up, going to school here, playing rock right, in front right of there. my house. I see your house, that yeah. old house across the street, and that hurts. Yeah. That hurts. But you have to come back and do this kind of a story here with us. It's just hard on us, and it's probably just as hard on you. I'm sure. It's important that as a Yukon hunter, you maximize the use of wild game. When you're ready to enjoy some of the wild meat you've harvested, thaw only the amount you need for a meal. Thawing it in a refrigerator takes about 24 hours. And remember, cuts that were not hung before freezing can be aged or tenderized for a few days in the refrigerator. This should be done with the wrapping still on the package. 
Wild game meat can be cooked about the same as any other red meat. But remember, wild meat is very lean. Overcooking can cause it to dry out. If your packages are in meal-sized portions, there'll be few leftovers. Whatever is not eaten immediately is good for use in soups, stews, or stir-fries. Keep in mind, respect wildlife. Take only what you need, use all that you take. A reminder from Yukon's Department of Renewable Resources and the Yukon Fish and Game Association. David Storschuk moved to Cassiar when he was a child. Now, an aspiring singer-songwriter, he wanted to give back something to the community he says gave him so much. Yukon Today spoke to him at Daymar Studios, a music recording company in Whitehorse. Snow. Incredible amount of snow. Our first year, I remember my mother digging out our windows so that she could have sunlight. It's bizarre. It's a lot of snow. And uh, shoveling snow off the panel boats. Panel boats, panel boats. That's probably one of my biggest memories. One of the first ones, anyway. My grade two teacher, Mrs. Clark. It was great. I don't remember ever um, having a hard time finding friends. Had some good ones, had some bad ones, but when we left Cassiar, um, I don't remember it as much as my parents do, but apparently my brother and my sister and myself made their life just about miserable. They saved, they saved their money and they worked really, really hard. They worked a lot of hours, both my mom and my father. And they, they moved to the Okanagan. They bought a place there with a pool and they were living high and mighty, I think, there. They, it, it had paid off. The seven years they'd been in Cassiar had paid off. And um, within a year and a half, we were back home. They, they, I don't know. They keep on saying that it was the uh, kids that motivated them to go back. I'm not sure how that worked, but nevertheless, in a year and a half later, we were back in Cassia. It was the best time of my life, being all my, own, my old friends. They were all there. I was doing income taxes for the, for the folks in town. My the reason for being there is the, the doom of Cassia was, was imminent at that time. And I thought that if I could be there to assist the folks to, to clean up their income taxes, because it was around tax time, as quickly as possible, then they would be able to get their money and those kind of things straightened away. And it was, it was a good idea, and, and, it, and it worked really well for, for them and for me. Um, but when I was doing the taxes for the folks, they'd come in and they'd spend about 15 or 20 minutes with me. Small talk would, would always come up, and almost every one of them would, would talk to me, and they didn't know where they were going to go. They didn't know what they were going to do. They didn't have a job and they were having a very difficult time finding work. And where do you look? Do you go to Alberta? Do you go to BC? Where do you go? They just didn't have a clue. The NDP government wasn't um, really appreciated that time, so leaving, fleeing BC was almost a good idea. But, but it was really, it left me in a tremendous melancholy mood. And just about at the end of every day, I was a little bit bummed out because these folks, some of them I had known for years, they had known me since I was this high, making all kinds of noise in that little band room. They, um, they didn't know where they were going to go. And so I just, at one morning, I'd, I'd woken up and I decided to go visit somebody and I, they had a piano and I just started playing out some chords and it was, it was a pretty, it's a, to me it sounded like a pretty chord progression and I just started putting words to it and I thought, why not try to do a tune for the town that's meant more to me than any other place I've ever been. And so I just tried, and the words, actually the lyrics, was one of the easiest parts for me. They just came out like crazy. The fortunate thing about it is some of the people that I, I played hockey with were now musicians. Like one of the one of the one of my little um, one of my favorite hockey players was uh, Richard Knowles. He was a goalie, and I was a goalie, and he was great. And I would always watch him. And I come back so many years later, and he's actually a bass player and singer in a band. And I and I joined up with that band, and it was a terrific time played a lot of times in the bar, a lot, a lot in the, um, we played parties, we played um, the last, um, the last time there was a dance there sponsored by the steel workers, we played that one, that was a very emotional dance. It, that was the first time that we actually played our song in public and um, it was, I was very nervous because I, I really didn't think that my, the song that I'd written was was worthy of 
folks hearing it, but after while I was writing it, um, a close friend kept telling me that you got to play this for the band. It's really nice, and I, I, I just I really didn't believe her, but she said it was really good. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll try it. Played it for the band. They liked it right away, and then we put together a four-track recording of it, learned it, and uh, played it right away. Played it in the bars. I'll never forget. Remember um, Len Moth, big burly man. He, um, I played uh, that tune, the third song into the first set for the Steelworkers, and that was the last Everything on the Steelworkers party for everybody there. Everybody was invited. And uh, he came up to me after that, after the set break, and he just, he had a tear in his eye, and I'll never forget that, and shook my hand and said, he thanked me for the song. That was, him saying that was, was worth any trouble it may have been either emotionally or physically in putting the tune together, that was worth it. I, I, I always think about that town, always do. I'll never ever forget that town. I've lived in quite a few places and that's, that's the town that sticks in my head. It always felt like home. It was a weird feeling. You don't know why the smell in the air, the drink of the wa drinking the water, it was weird. You could walk into that town and you knew. It, there's, I don't know, there must have been some connection between um, it was just bizarre. You, you knew it was there. You could smell it. You could smell the trees. It was home. I, um, I always thought I could always come back there, or at least visit. And the f one thing that frustrated me was that I knew that very soon that there was no way I was going to come back because there was going to be nothing here. I never realized there was going to be nothing here until I was there a few days ago and saw all those gutted ho houses and things like the theater just torn up and not even recognizable at all. It looked like it was bombed. People just picked up houses and just left the, uh, the basements. It was just disgusting. The, the town looked like it was filled with craters, wooden craters. Yeah, she's toast. Town's gone. I hope that, uh, I hope that the tune can be like uh, my way of thanking the town and the people that supported me and if it could do that then it, that's worth it. Lights turn on the dancing crowd. A whisper of the reasons why things change today. How many years of prosperity just fades away? Here in an urban town, the big city lights cannot be found. So hard to find a new game to play Don't know where to go or just how far away Not doing much, time is now moving slow Unemployment still rising high, I heard it on the radio Goes down. 
street lights turn on the dance around The truck is loaded, say goodbye to time to place the blame Cassie always gone, it will never be the same I first came to Cassiar when I was four years old. I grew up here, moved away, and became a reporter. I always wanted to do a story about Cassiar, but I never realized I'd be doing a story like this. For Yukon Today, I'm Gordon Lovren.